Hey everybody, welcome back. I wanted to talk about my experience with working at a county jail for 10 years, for a decade, from 2007 to 2017. And I want to talk about the things I learned, um, things I experienced while working there and how it sort of changed me over the course of 10 years. I was a medical records clerk in the medical department and um, even though I didn't, I, I still had quite a bit, bit of exposure to things that went on there, um, crimes I heard about. I still had to deal with inmates and inmates, family members, things like that, correctional officers. I, I dealt with everybody, even just as a medical records clerk. So um, I'll just dive right in here. So uh, first thing I learned within the first week is I, I wasn't too happy about it. I bet a lot of you people wouldn't be too happy about it either. You found out where... Uh, I guess I'll go over that now. Maybe now you'll learn, but you would probably wouldn't be too happy. I wasn't too happy to finding out where a lot of my tax dollars are going to. I mean, I understand that they're, these inmates or detainees are still human. Somebody had to take care of them, but it's like something I know, you know, people are innocent until proven guilty, but uh, still, even if they're proven guilty, it's still, I, I, I know they're still human. Somebody has to take care of them, but it's still makes me feel kind of upset that people, you know, commit crimes and yet they're kind of rewarded for it in jail and prison. So, um, yeah, I did, I mean, I, I think everybody pretty much knows nothing, even if you're getting something for free, I learned real quickly that nothing's for free. Somebody's always paying for it, which in my case and everybody's case, it was that, you know, as far as the care of the inmates, it was the tax dollars, the county tax dollars, the residents of the county that were paying for all this, and um, <clears throat> it wasn't the best, but, I, you know, they get uh, medical care, pretty cheap medical care, dental care, mental health care. I know it's not the best, but still it is care, and um, it's uh, they, there's still a fee that they, it's mostly uh, money you know, that goes on to their books that from family members, friends, whoever, co-workers, and, um, and we still, even if they didn't have money on their books, we would just give them a negative balance. And it wasn't, I mean, if they had a negative balance and they left when they got released or whatever, they weren't made to pay it. It would just get reinstated if they ever came back. There were a lot of people who came back and they are like, wait a minute, I had $100 on my books. And it's like, well, no, wait a minute. The last time you left here, you had a negative six, you know, you had a negative $50 balance. So that's why you only have $50 on your books instead of 100 But, you know, they had a negative balance. We wouldn't... Um, refused to see them for medical care or dental care, mental health care, x-rays, medications, things like that. Again, it's not the best, but it, it's still something. Um, so I, I learned that a lot of that uh, stuff was taken care of by the taxpayers, the medical care and the dental care, things like that. Uh, though there are, like I said, it's not the best and there are limitations. It's not, uh, you can't get the same things you can get on the outside. And I learned that the I pretty much uh, knew the food wasn't the best, but they had the food. Uh, even the food they served the employees wasn't very good, but they said, oh, yeah, this is better than the food they served the inmates. So I'm like, wow, I'd hate to see, hate to try their food. And the, I did find out that the um, food was pretty much absolute garbage. They have a lot of things like beans, and we're not talking very good. We're not talking like Southern Carolina barbecued baked beans. We're just talking... Well, you know, a lot of the food was unseasoned. We're talking about plain old baked boiled beans, however they made them, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, food looked gross and it smelled pretty gross. A lot of cabbage, collard greens, stuff like that. Um, turkey bacon, which to me, I've had turkey bacon. It has like no flavor compared to regular pork bacon. Um, and there is, uh, so I'm pretty thankful for the food that I do get to eat. It made me more thankful for the food that I got to eat. And... Um, they do have better food. That, I think in, we the economy got bad. We used to have these things called fresh favorites where you could get like burgers, pizza, things like that. And there was commissary, but it's mostly junk food where they can get like, you know, potato chips, Doritos, candy, Flaming Hot Cheetos, the, things like that, Red Hots, uh, or not the Red Hot, the Oreos, uh, Atomic uh, Flaming Atomic Fireballs. They're, they're kind of like, you know, giant, they're like, they look like jawbreakers, but they're like giant Red Hots. Things like that. Yeah, I think they were called atomic fireballs. Um, 
but yeah, mo most of that, is, they couldn't get that if they had a negative balance. That was, you know, money that was put on their books for their commissary. So the inmates that had more money, they were able to get that. But some of the inmates that didn't have money were pissed that they couldn't get their commissary. And a lot of them would refuse medical care and dental care because they wanted to save their money for their commissary. And you basically, um, oh, they're in commissary, you basically have ramen noodles and the inmates do eat a lot of that. Um, that's probably the best thing that they do get. And um, you basically, oh, they're in commissary. You basically eat what they feed you, and you don't get to watch what you want on TV. Um, you know, you've got all these guys, you know, 50, 60 guys in the cell block. They can make suggestions to the correctional officer, but, you know, you got 60 guys. They all want to watch something different, and it's basically like, you know, the correctional officer just has to make a choice as to what, you know, there's, you know, limitations as to what they can watch or they can't see, or they're not supposed to see anything with nudity or violence or, things like that. I think they did have like movie days and there were some movies that were actually playing by the correctional officers that the other people found inappropriate. I think there was a lieutenant or a sergeant who walked in with cell block and for those of you who are familiar with that movie of uh, the Wolf of Wall Street or the Wolf of Wall yeah it was Leonardo DiCaprio. There's a lot of nudity in that. A lot of violence and illegal activity and I think as soon as a lieutenant or sergeant walked in that cell block he made the correctional officer turn that off and I was like what are you thinking showing them something like that there are tons of nudity and sex and violence in that movie so uh yeah you don't really you basically uh watch on tv what they put on normally you don't get I think in prison they do have like of course there's limitations on how many channels if you can buy just get the basic channels but I know um some of the guys in prison get their own TV in their cell. Um, it's not the best. I'm not just talking about the danger of other inmates having to watch your back uh, for violent, any kind of violence or assaults, things like that. That's not the best living conditions. Um, I think that it's better in prison than if you get a mattress, but the jail I worked at, they just got like, a, you slept on a steel plate and you just got a mat, no pillow or anything like that, unless maybe you had a I think they did, some of them did get extra blanket. I think they got a blanket too, and I think uh, due to some medical conditions, they could get extra blankets if they asked for it, if if it was approved. And you know, you basically sit on a steel toilet. You, you got uh, uncomfortable chairs, steel chairs. You don't get a nice, comfortable recliner. So I'm really com I'm really uh, thankful for the my comfy bed, the living conditions that I have. Never been to jail, and don't ever. And, tend on going so I'm very, very thankful for the life that I live the living conditions that I have and there's a lot of manipulating that goes on you know these inmates they uh, one of the things I found out is I've never been locked up but from what I heard being locked up you just have no nothing but time to think all day all day all when you're supposed to be sleeping when you're conscious when you're awake you basically have nothing to do but think think about whatever, and a lot of them think about ways to manipulate the system. We did have a lot of drug addicts in there, uh, at least in the county jail I worked in, a lot of drug addicts, probably more than half of the inmates had drug problems, and a lot of them would fake injuries, would fake, we saw it on camera all the time. There was a guy that was walking down the stairs, and it was so obvious that he faked a fall so that he could get pain medication, and uh, they said you're kind of limited as to the medications you can get in there. It's not, you don't get Vicodin, the real good stuff if that's what you're looking for but we did have a lot of they used to call them drug seekers got guys that were seeking to get pain meds and um there was as far as uh, you know me i had a i did get a lot of disability claims guys uh they were trying to get disability and women too they were trying to get disability and i would have to copy the records send them to the state to ssdi and um a lot of, I don't know, you know, I've never heard about the outcome as to how many of these inmates got disability or not, but it said on there why they were trying to get disability. And it really, uh, and some of them were admitting that they were getting disability. Uh, it, it was amazing. There was a guy who was in there that had high blood pressure. A lot of the correctional officers due to the stress of the job had high blood pressure. And there was an inmate in there that was getting disability because he had high blood pressure, claimed he couldn't work. And it's like all these people were like, what the fuck? You know, I I have high blood pressure. I have anxiety. I have depression. Look at me. I'm still working. And, uh, but yeah, the descriptions as to what how they were trying to get disability, like they had uh, knee replacements, hip replacements, a bad back, 
um, high blood pressure, like I said, anxiety, depression. Uh, there's plenty of jobs you can get if you can't communicate English. Uh, I know that from working in food service. Uh, all the years I worked in food service, English was actually the second language. I, I don't speak Spanish, but Spanish was the predominant language. But there was actually one guy in there, he was trying to get disability because he couldn't speak right or um, read English. It's like, come on. And there was a guy that was in there because he had a, or he was trying to get disability because he supposedly had a learning disability. It's like, there's plenty of jobs you can get with these. You know, I always say if, um, you know, you have this type of disability, find a job where you don't have to, don't do a physical job where you're you having to use this. You've got a bad knee, you got a knee replacement, hip replacement, fine. I understand that. Um, maybe you're in chronic pain. Well, get a job where you don't have to do physical labor. You don't have to use that disability. But that's just me. I don't know how it, I know it used to be easier to get disability. I know now the long, the waiting period can be a pretty long time. Uh, I think they said the average is over like 500 days to get it, if you even do get it. And they said a lot of time people get turned down the first time they try to get it. They might have to apply a second time. It's a long process. You have to get an attorney disability attorney so i'm not sure about now i mean i'm not sure about back then but i know now it's a lot harder to get disability than it used to be and same with depression you know i just know from my because i suffer from depression i just know myself if i don't work if i just sit around the house all day and don't do anything just watch tv just sit around the house all day and snack on potato chips that's not gonna make that would make me dep i just know from being unemployed in the past it was depressing and I got so happy when I got a job. So it's like somebody, unless they, I don't know, unless there's, it's really, really severe depression that they can't even work. But I, I just don't get it. It's like, to me, it's like, I understand you have depression, but it's like, you'd be better off working 40 hours a week or even, you know, part-time. It's like, what makes you think that sitting around the house all day doing nothing is going to make your depression any better? I, that really irked me. Um... So yeah, my in my opinion, there were a lot of you know <laughs> fraudulent disability claims or near fraudulent disability claims. There was actually one inmate in there that he was um, yeah he was getting disability, and his wife I guess they I think we reported it, but yeah, his somebody in his family or his wife was still getting his disability checks, and it's like hello, the system out there when somebody's in jail and somebody's in prison, their disability benefits should be stopped. Nobody should be collecting that. <laughs> And, uh, do, you know, it goes along with that and a lot of these things I mentioned already with the crimes people, you know, committed. committed. Um, you know, I used to have a better outlook on society, but now I have a worse outlook. It, maybe it's a good thing. I don't trust people. As much. I used to be too trusting, and I got screwed over in the past in a number of ways. Um, you know, I got used. I got scammed, it, you know, numerous ways, numerous times. And I don't trust people as much as I used to. And it's probably a good thing because I was a little too trusting, a little too nice. It kind of toughened me up a little bit dealing with these inmates and seeing the things, seeing how people could be manipulating. And it's funny, you, you came across, not that it was our business, but came across some inmates every once in a while that would really be honest and say, yeah, even they, though they weren't convicted, a lot of them say, yeah, I did it. And, you know, I'm sorry. They, they'd, they'd say that, you know, I was stupid. Um, you know, they wouldn't make excuses. They would say, you know, I did it and I'm going to, you know, make my life better once I get out of here and start a new life. Every once in a while you come across an inmate that would be really sorry about what they did and they would admit what they did, you know, what they did wrong, learn from it. But so many of them in there would uh, say that it was kind of like a Shawshank Redemption. A lot of them in there, they're like, oh, I didn't do it. Or, you know, it's someone else's fault. They, they, they would make excuses or blame other people. A lot of them were innocent. Or if they did admit that they did, it was always someone else's fault that they got caught or that they got, you know. It, it, I, I think, you know, what with a lot of the drug addicts that were in there, I think a lot of that was just, was just getting caught up with the wrong crowd. But it's like, you know, when you're a grown man, you could have said no. You're, you know, you're a teenager. You could have said no to drugs, no to drinking and driving. But uh, yeah, a lot of them would always make excuses for their, if they did admit to doing, you know, there was one guy in there that got a DUI, but yeah, it wasn't his, you know, he was blaming his father for it. He said his father was threatening to beat the shit out of him. They were drunk. They got into some arguments and physical altercation. And he got in the car and 
drove away drunk off his ass and ended up getting a DUI, but he wasn't accepting any. It's like you could have won. You didn't have to get in your car, but, you know, he was blaming his father for his DUI because he said his father was trying to beat the shit out of him. It's like, again, you didn't have to grab your keys and get in your car. You could have ran. You could have walked. You could have called somebody else for help. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was just like uh, a lot like the Shawshank Redemption. Everybody's innocent, you know, and um, there was one guy that got convicted of murder, and he's like, oh, to the day I die, I didn't do it, and got like 30 years in the slammer in prison, and then he's like, oh, I'm just, it was kind of funny in a way, he's like, yeah, I'm just looking forward to a burger, and a, having a burger, and a nice, big, fat, juicy burger, and a beer when I get out, and yeah, see you in 30 years, <laughs> and it, it's so funny when they get convicted, and they get all this evidence against them, it's like, you're just a unluckiest person in the world you know <laughs> all this evidence against you and you're still trying to cop out of it so yeah well, I mean as younger people in there um I admit when I was younger I didn't always accept responsibility for my actions the choices I made in life and as I got older and, and then that now you know I accept responsibility for it yeah there are a lot of younger people in jail than older people but again even the, a lot of these older guys in there it's like a lot of them just don't take personal care and responsibility for their lives for their choices their actions and um you know I thought people were better I was kind of like disappointed in a way I thought people were better people but I learned that, you know, bad crime could even, it could be your neighbor, your, you know, family member, a coworker, a friend, um, even your own child. You know, I thought that uh, people were better people in, um, you know, neighbor, neighbor, even in good neighborhoods, even in rich neighborhoods, crime could take place. Someone told, you know, because I used to think that drug dealers always lived in bad neighborhoods. Someone said, oh, no, you know, your neighbor that lives in a $500,000 house, you know, that could be a drug dealer. You might not have any clue. They could do something else for a, a living. I think there was a rich neighborhood where this guy lived in a multi-million dollar house. And uh, it kind of made sense now. I guess he was just a flooring contractor. And it's like, I kind of thought that my, if I were a neighbor, I would kind of, I'm not sure what his wife did. Uh, but if I were a neighbor, I would think, damn, as a flooring contractor, because that's just a middle class job. Like, how can you afford a multi million dollar house? But it turned out he was a drug dealer, so a lot of them have covers for it. Um, but yeah, I uh, heard about some pretty bad crimes working there in really good areas, too. Gruesome, brutal, just grotesque crimes. Unbelievable. It's just insane. I, I couldn't, I never knew people like this existed until I worked there. And the thing is, it's not really made that aware. I mean, you can't cover the news. I know, I know in the news, they, they're they kind of limited as to, they can't cover every story, but the news, I mean, obviously, the news, you know, covered people like John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, people like that. Um, but a lot of times, because, I mean, obviously, those are pretty grotesque, brutal crimes, but a lot of times the news stations, they don't cover the most it went it's in your local area, if it's in a city, it might be covered. But a lot of times, if you're, you know, if it's in a residential neighborhood, something like that, and the, they usually don't cover. They want people to think that the neighborhood is great, and they want people to think that you know the city's a shithole. And um, a lot of times, when a, gr a grotesque, brutal, a real serious crime like that happens in a good residential neighborhood, they don't cover it because they don't want people. I don't know if they don't want people to be scared, or they just want keep the good image of the neighborhood going. But a lot of times these news stations, they don't cover the most brutal crimes like that. So people don't really know about it. I found out about it. And um, another thing I found out, and just as many white people end up in jail as other races. And, you know, in the movies, they make it look like it's mostly minorities in jail. And I used to think it was mainly minorities in jail, not white people. But... Um, you know, FBI statistics will show you that white people commit more crimes than other races. And um, just as uh, as an example, I mean, a lot of um, when it comes to like drug cases, a lot of the you know, the drug users out there, I mean, white people make up the majority of the population. So it just stands to reason that just as many of them end up in jail as other races. And a lot of the, you know, the drug users in there were actually what, heroin, cocaine addicts. It wasn't usually minorities doing that. It was usually the white guys, the white women. A lot of the, um, as we did this jail I worked in, we had like, you know, the population fluctuated from time to time. But uh, we had anywhere from, um, 
uh, on average, the 10 years I worked there, I'd say probably 550 to 700 inmates. And uh, there were, on the average, there were always like, there's one cell block for the women. A lot of women were in there for drug charges. There was only 50 female inmates on the average, and the other 700 were men. So seven, you know, so let's just say 750, the general population. But um, getting back to what I was saying, you know, just as many white people end up in jail as other races, and a lot of people fail to understand that. I fail to understand that, but it's just that they usually get out of there faster. They usually have, like, somebody in their family, even if they, they're in for a real uh, high, uh, high bond. Usually, you know, family members or friends don't, you know, Co-workers don't want, they might have a bunch of people get together, take a donation, everybody, so, you know, they um, sum up the money to get them out. A lot of people don't want their kids in that kind of environment, their friends, their family members in that kind of environment. So just as many white people end up in there as other races, but it's just a lot of the white people, they tend to, they know somebody that has money and then they usually get out of there fast, they get bonded or bailed out faster if they're in for a pretty violent crime, high bond, you know, um, and not everybody in jail is a bad person. I, I know that because I knew people uh, that went to high school. A lot of I came across a lot of people I went to high school with that were in that jail, and uh, a lot of them just got in with the wrong crowd. Um, a, a lot of them were uh, drug addicts, and um, you know they they were good. Good. A lot of drug addicts are good people. They just got in with the wrong crowd. They got hooked. There was peer pressure at a young age, and. Um, you know, I, a lot of these judges, they think that, you know, jail is, and I'm, I'm just going to say that um, jail isn't really rehabilitating. I don't think it is for the most part. You know, so many people get out of jail or prison, they, they return to crime, they can't get a job, they go back uh, to jail or prison, and it's just not, it's more or less a holding facility, just a detainment in a sense. Um but yet, sixty-five percent of inmates in this jail had mental um, mental health issues, and I think you know these judges. Again, getting back to what I said a moment ago, a lot of these judges they think that jail is the right place for these drug addicts, these mentally ill people. But I think that uh, it's not. I think it might make them worse. I think that uh, even though you know people return to drug rehab, I mean we we've seen that with Hollywood actors and. You know, movie stars, uh, professional athletes, a lot. Like there was that, um, who was it? Was it Stephen um, from Aerosmith? Was it Stephen Tyler that got out of drug rehab? And someone said he shot up heroin in the parking lot before he even left. So is you know we can even we you know drug rehab isn't always the best choice, but it, it, it's a step in the right direction, better than jail, I think, and a lot, I think a lot of these inmates, you know, should, that they have mental health issues, would be better off in a mental health facility, but uh, judges tend to think that uh, jail is the uh, prison is the, uh, I guess, the way for them to be rehabilitated, but I don't think it is. They think that that's the uh, answer, and uh, I don't think that is the answer. Um, and I imagine that jail can be, and from what I've heard from other people, it can be pretty boring. I imagine time goes by pretty slow, but at the same time, it's uh, scary. I mean, if you got any sense, you, uh, you you want to protect yourself. I imagine you've got to watch your back just about every second that you're awake. I imagine stuff could even happen to you when you're asleep. You probably, I'd probably be afraid to sleep, but yeah, I just can't imagine being the time won't by so slow. Um, I just know time goes by slow when you're scared, when you're nervous, and uh, I just imagine time goes by so slow being bored and scared to death at the same time. Um, let's see, and there were a, there was a lot of playing around that went on. A lot of these correctional officers were married or in relationships, and some of the nurses, uh, a lot of the correctional officers were having affairs with the nurses and the EMTs, the techs. And a lot of them, a lot of the nurses, the EMTs were in relationships, marriages too. Um, and no surprise, there were a lot of the correctional officers were divorced. Some of them were on their second or third marriages. They just went and jumped from like one relationship to the next. And um, I can see why, but I guess, you know, you have to be controlling at work. I imagine it's hard to go home and turn off that controlling attitude, that controlling demeanor, behavior. Um... But yeah, it's like, yeah, if you're cheating, it, it doesn't surprise me that you're on your second, you got caught. It doesn't surprise me that you're on your 
second or third marriage, and some of the correctional officers actually seemed like they were a little bit crazy and for real. I'm not just making this up. And um, they had to pass a psychological psychological exam in order to become an officer. And I know a lot of times people will say, like, God, how the hell did he pass a psychological psychological exam? How the hell did he? How the hell did she pass a psychological exam? And a lot of times I was like, yeah, it makes me wonder. And then um, someone said, like, oh, maybe you have to be a little bit crazy to work here. And from what I heard about the psychologist that was doing the psychological exams, one of the officers went to see him, and he was, like, it was in the middle of the wintertime. And um, he had, like, a, I guess his hair in, like, a man bun, and he had, like, a button-down dress shirt and no undershirt on. I guess he had a button-down. He was doing the psychological exam, and he had it buttoned down and his chest was showing, chest hair was showing, and then he had like his bare feet and a foot massager. And this um, one officer that was doing a psychological exam, I guess he got asked afterwards, like, oh, what what could I do to improve? And he said, oh, you might want to keep your shirt buttoned up. You might want to keep your shoes on next time you do an exam. And he said, oh, I just want to be comfortable. He said, oh, well, yeah, that's fine. But you, with the way you were dressed, you had your shoes off. Like that made me feel kind of uncomfortable. It sounded like he had, uh, you know, they, they say a lot of times people in the mental health field, they need help themselves. And they say sometimes these uh, mental health workers are, some of them are sicker than their patients. And, yeah, I definitely believe it. But it just surprised me they only have to do this. I know one friend of mine is a cop. He works on the road, not in a jail as a correctional officer. And he has to do, like, yearly check-ins to make sure that he's still doing okay psychologically. And if he's not doing okay psychologically, he can't return to work until he's mentally stable. However, that would be with medication or he's always checked in okay. But it really surprised me that the, I think a lot of these correctional officers due to the environment were starting to go crazy. I know I would. You know, I'm going to deal with that year after year, day after day, and, you know, month after month, week after week. And I thought to myself, yeah, it really surprises me that they, they could work there for 20 or 30 years and they just have to do a psychological exam and never have to do a check-in after all the years of working there in that kind of environment. I thought that wasn't right. I thought that they should have maybe a check-in at least, if not every year, at least like once every five years to make sure that they're doing okay because there is some pretty fucked up shit that goes on in jail. So that even I saw and heard about. And, um... So there's that, and um, I learned that, you know, some inmates are being comfortable. I would never be comfortable with that, but some inmates were comfortable with being locked up for life. Um, they knew if they got out, you know, there was no job for them, that they, nobody would want to hire them, which is, I think, I think there are inmates out there to get out, and they want to make a life for themselves, but, you know, nobody will hire them, so it's like, what do they do? They go back to committing, they go back to stealing, drug dealing, committing crimes again, and where do they go? They go back to jail, they go back to prison. It, it really is a shame uh, for somebody who really wants to change their life. Um, some of them don't, but yeah, you know, they, they figure there's no job, nobody's going to hire them, so they have no way, to, and nobody wants to be married to them, to somebody like that, so they know there's no way... No way to rely on, a lot of them don't have family in their life, friends in their life, except for jail, prison. So I know there's no way of uh, providing for themselves except by, you know, committing more crime, which, you know, would more likely land them back in jail or prison. And I guess they just decided to get accustomed to it. Again, going back to the Shawshank Redemption, we saw it in that movie, how, uh, you know, they just got... Um, Morgan Freeman was talking about being institutionalized. You know, you're that one guy who was in uh, that old guy who was in jail for 50 years, and he didn't want to go. He didn't want to leave. And I think nowadays they give you the choice of staying if you want, even if your time is up in, a, in that sense. But he uh, remember he got out and he um, was having trouble fitting into society. He was having trouble working and ended up committing suicide. So that can happen in real life. So, um, yeah, some of them, they, I guess after so many years, you just get used to that kind of environment. You, yeah, Morgan Freeman did also say, you know, he's like, these walls are funny. At first you hate them. Then he's like, then you get used to them. He said enough time passes, you get to the point where you depend on them. So I imagine that, uh, yeah, it was a great movie. But yeah, I imagine you could get that way, being locked up for so many years. And um, all in all, overall, from what I gathered about jail, it's basically a negative environment. Uh, even as an employee, it can get pretty depressing. What really depressed me is there was, like, no windows. And I kind of rely on 
sunlight for my happiness, my a good mental state, being mental state of mind. And um, at one point, I went back to working five eights. I was working Monday through Friday, seven to three. And at one point, I wanted to get an extra day off, so I figured I'll do four tens. And in the and back, this was back in Illinois. And during the winter time, at seven o'clock in the morning, I was working seven to five. Tuesday, I took Monday off. I was working Tuesday through Friday, seven to forty hours a week, seven in the morning till five o'clock at night. And for uh, that, for so for forty hours a week, I didn't see the sunlight at all in the winter time because you know at seven o'clock in the morning in December, and January, it's still dark out at seven o'clock in the morning, and it's already dark at five. So it's like I didn't. See, I when you saw the sunlight on the weekends, that was really depressing. And even when. Um, the sunlight was out, so I went back to working seven to three, Monday through Friday, five eights. But even um, the sun would just hit you when, even the summertime, for example, you not, not getting any sunlight all day. It's real bright and sunny outside. You'd leave at three o'clock in the afternoon, and bam! It, the sunlight would practically blind you. We'd be, I, um, you know, without sunglasses, you'd be squinting like crazy. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have. That's um, what I gathered. From working in a jail for 10 years, things I observed. Uh, I don't really want, I did do another video about crime. I'm not going to talk about that because I already did a video on that. But yeah, there's some crimes I heard about in there you wouldn't even want to know about. Uh, let me know if you want me to link. I did that video probably about three or four years ago. If you want me to link you to that video, I will, about the most brutal crimes I heard about working in a jail for 10 years. Something to, like, like that, something to that effect. But, um... Yeah, that's what it was like working in a jail for 10 years. Things I saw, things I heard about, things I observed, and how it changed me and to toughen me up a little bit and changed my outlook on society, which isn't as good now as it was 15, 16 years ago. So um, I've ran around long enough. I think that covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, questions, let me know. Uh, comment, like, share, subscribe. And we'll talk to you all real soon with another great video. Have a great day, everybody, and stay out of jail, please. <laughs> You'll thank me later if you ever do end up in jail. Don't even think about committing any crimes. All right, talk to you all later. Bye-bye.